to this next week and my name is Dr. Craig Norris and here we are doing the next topic of viewing. So thank you for those who are joining us on the live stream um, and uh, this should be quite a short lecture, uh, basically just going over some key concepts around the idea of how we view things, the act of viewing, the act of the gaze, the act of looking at objects. Uh, so of course this is uh, with, a, with a kind of media orientation. So let me pop my head out of the space so we can read that quote. And what we're looking at here in particular around the idea of viewing is a quote from uh, Sean Shimpach stating, viewing implies a singular, idealized, individual process. It is an active activity, a verb. This is opposed to an audience, an entity only in the aggregate. An audience is a thing, a noun. When an audience is said to be active, the first activity implied is viewing. So again, the idea that I want to explore in today's chat is this idea of defining viewing not as a, a noun, but instead as a verb, an act of viewing. And moving away from the idea that um, viewing is really only understood as a um, act of audiences doing things, but instead, you know, well, instead of this image of, of, of seeing it only as, as audiences doing something, to instead see it as uh, an act of, of, of behavior. So you're yeah, moving away from a kind of noun of, of a viewing audience, or even this image, right? I mean, we're getting closer probably with this image of an overreaction. I mean, who, the wonderful performance here, what are they watching? What possibly could they watch to, do, to, to react this way that's appropriate across all those age limits? Uh, it does seem that it, for the, uh, let's assume it's the wife to react in that way. Uh, uh, has that been an appropriate choice? Maybe the dawning realization of the parents of scarring your children for life. Certainly the young daughter seems scarred from this, almost equivalent to The Shining. But anyway, moving away from this idea of viewing in this way to instead seeing it as an action and an activity and probably actually a little closer to this type of image. So this type of image of uh, one of my favorite articles uh, that I collected uh, from The Telegraph in the UK talking about watching horror movie films burns nearly 200 calories a time. The article goes on to talk about how uh, they wired people up to watch horror films and they uh, basically monitored their elevated heart rate and came to the conclusion that there are specific horror movies which will really create a strong visceral reaction. And this idea of a reaction of the body as you're watching is the idea of viewing which we're, we're moving towards in today's discussion, right? So how is it that we can lose calories by watching horror movies? Well, as this article is suggesting, it's because viewing, watching things, isn't passive. Even if we're sitting there in a cinema, our internal body, heart rate, right, uh, can uh, uh, kind of burn through calories, right? So as the first paragraph here in the Telegraph says, Viewers who put themselves through 90 minutes of adrenaline pumping terror can use up as much as 113 calories close to the amount burned during a half hour walk and the equivalent to a chocolate bar. Wow. So I think from memory, I and mean, it's been a while since I've read the article, but as the image would suggest, one of the most effective movies that they found in terms of what horror movies burnt the most number of calories by just sitting there and watching them was The Shining. I think Jaws was up there, Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, you know, probably anything that has a jump scare linked to it would probably uh, do well 
on this measurement. Uh, it'd be interesting actually to compare that to video games to see if video games would do a more effective job. Certainly maybe a game like Five Nights at Freddy's, uh, which is full of jump scares, might actually increase the number of calories burnt off because again, the act of viewing in a video game is even a little bit more participatory, right? Because you're, you're controlling the, the character, you're making decisions, you're possibly a little immersed through that or identifying a little stronger. Uh, so that's a quite fun way of thinking about how viewing can be an act, a verb, right? So here we're having watching horror films burns calories, so it's a very much a verb type action. Uh, probably what comes to many minds as soon as you start talking about horror and watching, you know, uh, is, is where PewDiePie name made his uh, uh, mark and brand, which was his visceral reaction to playing horror games. Uh, so here's a clip, of course, or not a clip, an image of PewDiePie reacting to a horror game, which, you know, does kind of lead credence to the idea that you're kind of going to lose calories by watching, that there's something about the viewing, the gaze, uh, which is going to uh, elicit this type of reaction. And, you know, um, um, a, a interesting scholar at the University of Tasmania, um, Dominic Leonard, uh, uh, did some recent research on, on horror films, uh, wrote a book on it uh, recently, it was published last year, and his finding was that um, you know, many uh, kind of anthropologists and, and people that observe uh, animal nature uh, uh, show that there's an attraction we have, an appeal we have to threat, right? So, so one of the explanations for this act of viewing and why we want to view horror films, here might be we lose weight, but also there's an idea that we're gaining information. We're gaining information on how to respond and react to what we know are threats, right? So there was a really interesting study done in the Sahara, I think, of, of how prey animals, uh, wildebeests and deer and monkeys and birds, would actually move towards and observe lines and predators, animals they know that are threats but they would move very close to them and watch them. And the idea here being that we could translate some of these theories that animals are watching their predators, or the prey is watching their, their, their predator, to learn about the predator as well. Through, through watching, you can get information. So again, this idea of, of viewing as an act, as an information act, can be really important. Uh, an interesting theory to go back to here, it's not in the reading, but it is one I think that's worth following up on, is Tom Gunning's idea of the cinema of attraction. And Tom Gunning was talking about um, early cinema. So a moment uh, during the um, early development silent film, you know, around 1907 to 1913, where filmmakers were seeking to make distinctive images that went beyond everyday life representations. So, you know, what Tom Gunning's talking about here are images like we're seeing here, kind of a little abstract, surreal, more like watching a circus act than watching a movie, right? More about watching a spectacle, about enjoying the imagery than needing a story. So. Tom Gunning had a look at early cinema, right, and said many of the experimental films or the type of filmmaking that was going on in early cinema wasn't at all what we'd associate with cinema today. That is, it was less interested in, or less exclusively interested in storytelling, right? So narrative was less interest, less less dominant, and many films, early silent films, early films during this period in particular were much more uh, abstract, painterly, um, full of imagery, m not at all interested in a story, and simply about creating uh, montages and combining images together, and, and much more, I guess, from maybe a point of view here, artistic. Uh, whereas post-1913, Tom Gunning says a lot of the real power of cinema was was overly focused on storytelling and, and lost some of its its strengths as a platform to not simply do storytelling, but also through image convey a whole set of other things. Uh, so he 
coined the term that this early cinema is really a cinema of attraction. Right? So again, uh, by attraction, he's talking about not a cinema of, of, of narrative, uh, kind of a much more emotive, emotional, uh, abstract, um, you know, meaning kind of rises to the, uh, the, the, the surface through the audience participating and, you know, what's going on here, I don't understand. Cinema of attraction, right? So these type of films draw viewers to focus on, on you know, animation or the thrill of watching an image. Um, um, maybe even like watching a theatre play or again as I mentioned being at a circus rather than you know was the story good um, and again that that's another way of understanding why viewing is important that um, cinema in some ways can be understood as as, a, as an act of viewing uh, or if we have a look at say for instance some of the work of David Lynch we could see some of this continued where a lot of his his work, such as um, Twin Peaks, is probably the most approachable one. But even within that, there's a lot of imagery, a lot of um, abstraction, a lot of um, you know moments where you're watching a David Lynch film or a TV show like Twin Peaks, and it's it it it's no longer a narrative story. It's it's a much more dream type story. So again, we can see aspects of the cinema of attraction continuing in work like David Lynch. Uh, also, interestingly, I reckon we can see ideas of cinema of attraction, that is the interest more in image and watching things and, and, and not needing narrative in some of these React videos. Like I like the stuntmen React ones because in many ways, what we're looking at here are moments where you know a film is kind of divorced from its narrative and instead there's a non-narrative focus on the stuntmen in these cases watching and viewing and gazing at objects and judging those objects so how particular choreography choreography occurs in that stunt um, kind of grimacing at the special effects linked to it and really talking about the stunt as a circus act, right? If we're thinking of a circus type viewing, um, we can see that that even though like John Wick has narrative and story to it, uh, you can watch Stuntman React and it's not at all talking about the story of John Wick. It's talking about the cinema of attraction of John Wick. That is its visuals, its, its stunt performance, its physicality, its you know, some of that could be linked to suspension of disbelief, right? Is that a believable act or not? So that could say there's still a narrative thread there. But I'd say even there, you know, it, 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 it's really speaking to a, a, a visual belief, a belief that this is a real phenomenon. But anyway, I'd say ultimately, yeah, some of those React videos, particularly when they abstract movie into its, you know, is this like CG artists react Stunt men react, doctors react. It suddenly transforms a storytelling medium into a, a cinema of attraction medium. Right? Do we see this as a exciting, amusing object? Do we judge it for its attraction? That is, you know, this is skillful, this is artistic. Or do we judge it for disinterest or repulsion or rejection? Uh, uh, you know, those those judgments based purely on its stunt performance or the art of its CG are about making assessments on viewing based on attraction rather than storytelling. Um, taking that idea even a little further, I'd say we can see in things like maps, like here in this example, because I've traveled quite a lot throughout Japan and for eight years at the media school, I ran the uh, New Colombo Plan trips to Japan where we'd take students to Tokyo to look at um, Japanese media, you know, television stations, movie studios, and so forth. Anyway, and one of the things that we, we would always struggle with is navigating through locations. Right? So here we have a blog talking about one location in Tokyo, Ikibukuro, and a particular road called the Otome Road or Maiden Road, if we're to translate that into English. And why I've chosen this is, again, um, 
this blog was talking about, okay, so if you want to shop for otome goods, right? So if you're a fan of uh, shoujo manga and anime, you know, manga and anime aimed at, at a female audience, you got to go to Ikebukuro, you got to check out Otome Road. But the problem of getting to this particular road in the city of Ikebukuro is that it's really hidden. I mean, if you've not been to Tokyo, it's one of the most densely populated metropolises in the world. And because of that, visually viewing it is a challenge. So what this blog does, and what I'm driving at here, is how we view things through today's internet culture. So the blog then has these beautiful Google Street View images, right? So Google Street View, I'd say, again, a kind of cinema of attraction. What we're presented with here is just a a moment, a slice in time, right? So when this was shot through the Google car that was moving around mapping the street view. What's interesting to me is this top view is just as it appears in the street view at that period of time, right? And you can see the density of this, right? So there's the skyscrapers. You can't really see how tall they are. Uh, this is a slightly more open space. But what's what these images are in this blog is the guide to finding Otomi Road basically had, gosh, about 20 street view maps saying, okay, you see this, this is what you'll see when you exit the east exit of Ikibukuro Station. And this is the sidewalk that you need to cross. So it's very much saying, you know, view the location around you. Keep looking because if you're looking purely at this map here, you will get lost. And many people talk about getting lost trying to find this street. They can never find it. And so what they refer to is, is the importance of viewing objects. And then within this, what I enjoy is in the bottom one, she's she's used, um, you know, MS Paint or something to put a little red square to highlight what we need to look at. So the idea of malleability, the idea of taking Google Street View, and then within that, um, um, you know, creating her own cinema of attraction in terms of highlighting specific visual locations and visual cues as you're doing your orient orienteering towards, uh, you know, the 20 odd minute walk to get to Otome Road. Um, the same thing at a different level, right? So viewing through, like what we can, what I'm raising here is the idea that viewing is an act and we can see that act of viewing, the verb viewing as an act by looking at how Google Street View again can trans, can require a literacy of viewing, right? So here's this artist's work. This is the work by the artist Mishka Henna called No Man's Land, right? And it's, it's worth viewing this this artwork. It's, it's really interesting. This is, I, I pulled this from the Juxtapose magazine. Okay, so what, what are we looking at here? This is a Google Street View. It seems to be in bushland somewhere. Um, um, the odd thing about this, of course, two ladies sitting in plastic seats. And what No Man's Land is referring to is moments where Google, the Google car creating the street view has accidentally captured, I think this is in Italy, uh, locations of prostitution. So these are two prostitutes in what's referred to as no man's land. The I believe this is right. I should have looked this up again before the talk. But anyway, I believe it's the case that in Italy, the type of prohibition around prostitution has meant this occurrence, where there are these locations out of city spaces, kind of in the middle of nowhere, where sol soliciting occurs. And Google Street Viewing, of course, has just accidentally captured this, captured these locations. So there's a whole series of locations that Mishka has put together based on accidental Google Street View locations to create this really incredible series of photos showing the type of, in this case, maybe even a more narrative storytelling which can occur in the most unexpected spaces through the gaze, right? So the Google Street View capturing all this material, we use Google Street View to orient ourselves, to navigate ourselves, to get to location A to B, but we can also use it to understand the world around us. Like last week's discussion of how media shapes reality, here we have an example of Google Street View giving us an insight into the reality of a location in terms of this shot is not about the rules of getting from A to B or traveling along a location, it's revealing an economy here, a solicitation economy. 
Um, uh, and again, the act of viewing that, the literacy required to unpack that, it's a very fascinating area to explore. Where I love this idea of viewing, of course, is that tension, right? So here we have an article, and I'll show you a series of articles here about, um, this one's entitled, Apple Maps Glitch Takes Drivers to Runway of International Airport. And this is a little screen capture, and the article reads, here's another reason why you shouldn't just blindly follow directions provided by your friendly neighborhood mapping service. An error on new iPhones and iPads directs drivers to a runway at a major international Alaskan airport. So the reason I chose this is because I wanted to talk about that tension around viewing. If you're viewing augmented reality, right? So if you're, if you're driving to a location, deferring the act of viewing to your you know, iPhone app, Google map, whatever it would be, it is a, again, it's, it's a verb. So you're, you're viewing the map and you're listening to the map as well and it's audio instructions, but you're viewing that little blue line and following it to determine your actions, right? But what happens when that is wrong? What happens when there's a dissonance between you should probably be watching the world outside the map to verify that the maps, the viewing that you're doing on the map is correct with the viewing around you. And so this dissonance, I think, what I'm trying to get at here is this idea that, you know, we know, for instance, a fictional movie and the idea of cinema of attraction is that we're watching a fantasy, we're watching a circus, we're watching a construction. But I'd say much like last week's discussion, all media is a construction and we should never forget that. It's not necessary. I mean, it is reality but it's also a constructed reality. So this construction can mean if you defer to a constructed reality, your actual experience of the real around you might be problematic in terms of, uh, it might not be showing you the real real, if I could use that language. Here's another one, Florida man drives down bike lane, trail because GPS told him to. And it does make you really scratch your head as to why someone would think that the bike trail, even though Google Maps is showing him that this is the way to get there, show you what he does, what they do, sorry. Um, and again, that, that, that tension around viewership, right? So what I'm saying here is that viewership really does come with skills, right? To view properly, to view the Google map properly, you need, at least in this case, judgment skills, right? The ability to evaluate the reliability and credibility of different information sources that you're viewing, right? So obviously you've got the information source that you're viewing on Google Maps, and you've got the information you're viewing as you actually use your eyes to look out the window of your car to <laughs> hopefully see what is physically around me. And again, what's interesting here is this dissonance, that why do we defer to what the Google Map is telling us to do and not our own, or what we could imagine is hopefully this guy or some, if there was a passenger with him, probably not. But if there was, you'd hope the passenger may have said, you know, hey, what are you doing? This doesn't seem right. Here's another one. GPS error sends Belgian woman on a 900 mile drive across Europe. So again, a moment where this deferral to an active viewing and treating the active viewing, the Google map as, uh, I guess, the truth as, as giving it much more uh, reliability and credibility than it should have, um, has meant she's made this silly trip uh, 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 through, a, through a mistake. You know, a final one, police man drives into harbor after GPS gives him wrong directions. There's so many of these, um, um, but I do think it does speak to this, this privileging of viewing, maybe privileging, or well, not just privileging of viewing, privileging of viewing and then within viewing privileging of 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 relying upon um um the reliability and credibility of of only one information source rather than multiple information sources and then assessing which is the right choice here and maybe this is where we get this type of image right so uh maybe this is where we're headed this idea that you know we can already see people are struggling with Google Maps, right? And there are examples there of people not making the right decision because they kind of, even though they can use their eyes to see around them, the, there's a cocooning going on through the viewing of the Google Map, 
that has meant people have not made the right decision. And here we see, of course, through the VR headgear, the literal blinding of the person to engage with only the augmented reality space. Again, this is sounding a little critical, so I don't mean to say, you know, this is a kind of Plato's cave moment where we're deferring our own or losing our own uh, agency and deferring to the um, you know the shadows cast on the cave wall by the fire, right? That that we've, we're we're basically disassociating reality. Uh, I'm not not saying that. I mean, it's worth looking at Plato's wall. It is a caution, but I am saying there are skills involved in viewing, right? And there are skills involved in viewing through VR as well as augmented reality that need to be learnt and acquired that are new in today's society. So if we're talking about how viewing has changed, what I'm getting at here is that viewing has changed, right? These stories show viewing has changed, right? The way we view a map has changed in terms of <laughs> getting us into bad situations, right? Uh, and where might this go if we're in virtual reality spaces as well? What type of new skills around judgment, evaluating re the reliability and credibility of sources uh, uh, might be required in these spaces? And the idea that we should participate in them rather than passively allowing us to have choices made for us, right? So I ultimately getting to the idea, of course, that we shouldn't see this as technological determinism, that these great new technologies of Google Maps and VR will inevitably lead to better lives. Yeah, that's not the case, right? We're, we're still the frail people and kind of indecisive thinkers that, that we've always been. We're still applying the same mind to those. So we do need to see these as still needing participation in our own skills. So just moving to some of the questions we'll be looking at this week, some of the things I'd like you to consider as you're looking through and considering your own acts of viewing is how has viewing changed in your lifetime, right? And particularly, have you, do you recall any stories or your own stories people have told you about things that have happened to them as the viewed things, right? So experience, like in the tutorial this week we talked about, or last week we talked about, you know, your first experiences with media technologies, your first experience of going to the cinema, of watching television, of playing a video game, and now maybe thinking now, right? How has how has your viewing changed, right? Um, I remember someone in the class mentioning that they recall the first time they were at the cinema, running out of the cinema, they were very young, and the size of the screen was too overwhelming, and they ran out of the cinema. That is an act of viewing, and obviously it's changed. They don't run out of the cinema now, but how has that literacy emerged? So, do you think cinema viewing or TV viewing are different in today's space, right? Uh, or have they become almost the same? And think, you know, creatively about that, right? So how do you engage with screens? So here's an image talking about the type of menu screens on apps, right? So this, this kind of, you know, these blue arrows taking us from one screen in an app to another. You know, there's two apps here, one is Squirt and the other one is Pet Rescue, right? The idea being that there's, an, there's a deliberate and conscious um, kind of architecture of menu design, color choice, and location of buttons to foster particular viewing actions, right? Acts where you see the act, you see the color, you see the objects, and it will lead you towards moving towards a certain direction, right? So that's 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 a kind of literacy which is emerging around particularly game type cultures, where as opposed to cinema, maybe if you're just watching a straight narrative film, you could say that there's more control in that space in terms of doing a um, a Star Wars film. You know the audience is sitting there, and you're telling the story across time the beginning, middle, end, and the audience halfway through it, unless you're watching Bandersnatch or something, aren't given the choices of what to do next. However, in a game, of course, there's you could say there's less control, right? There's less control because the gamer can constantly change or decide not to do something, decide not to go in that direction. 
But there is effort to control viewing or action. Action and viewing, right? So again, linking those two concepts in video games, right? So this type of literacy, use of colors, location of boxes, coding them so that the person, the player knows that they can break those type of boxes. Anyway, is a type of engagement and literacy within screen. And we'll spend some more time in class this week talking about that. Um, thinking about this question though of how has viewing changed? How has it changed with cinema, TV, and newer types of visual media? It does remind me of one of my favorite stories in the COVID-19 world which is this one from Kotaku talking about using GTA Online to return to a normal world of movie theaters and stores. And this, of course, was written in April 6th. So this was about, well, one month into most of the world being in some state of isolation or working at home or studying at home or being at home. Uh, what was interesting is this article talking about how, you know, this person writing the story of him going into the GTA Online world and finding just immense pleasure in, as he says in this first sentence, um, uh, uh, he's re relied on Grand Theft Auto Online to virtually leave my home and do things I miss, like seeing a movie. And he describes and recounts the pleasure of just going into the cinema space here and sitting down and watching it. And the idea that you know, it's a very meta viewing, right? So you're viewing and playing a game to view and play and act. Uh, that is nostalgic for a real act. Uh, again, I like those layers. I like that idea of of the desirability of viewing. Uh, that you're also playing a game in the way that the game designers didn't intend, but within that you're also conforming to a idea of of viewership, of of the pleasure of viewing a movie online. Um, the other question I'd like you to think about is is again, how is viewing changed through if you engage in second screening, right? When you do this and why? And I think if you can reflect or be conscious or mindful of that urge to bring out your phone or iPad or other laptop while you're watching a movie or a TV show, what is that impulse, right? What You've already got, you should have one source of information that you're focusing on, the TV show or the movie. Why have you got a second screen suddenly involved in this? What is the second screen doing to complement that, right? Are you looking at IMDb? To, I know I do this all the time. I'll watch a movie and it'll get a bit slow. And so I'll look at IMDb to look at the trivia section to get some kind of uh, uh, interesting, unusual insights into the movie. Um, so are you doing it to complement the film or are you doing it to really multitask within that? And as we all know with multitasking, you can't engage with the same thing 100% uh, uh, for both, right? If you're doing two things when you're multitasking, both those acts will be at less than 100% of attention and ability, right? So you know, what is occurring within this space? And why are you doing it? So again, those are just some of the questions that I'd like you to think about and consider for this week. I am back. And so, um, viewing, yeah, the act of viewing. And again, uh, doing a live lecture, it's always nice to be considering this act of viewing in terms of, you know, chat screens are appearing and comments appear. So the act again of, of audiencing in that, that people are watching. And again, I'd say one of the really interesting phenomena that has changed is the emergence of React videos, React YouTube shows. Uh, and then breaking down, why are those so important? Why are those interesting? Particularly, you know, if you can, while um, Cinema of Attraction isn't mentioned in the readings, I do urge you to uh, look at Cinema of Attraction, do a Google search and find out more about that. It's probably something we'll look at more in this week's class. So I hope you found some of those ideas interesting and do be more mindful of your viewing and consider where viewing has changed in today's media landscape. Thank you.